the glory of the King. Cause you alone are name above all names. You deserve all glory, power, and fame. We will rejoice in your praise for you are worthy. Yes, you are. Would you stand with me? I would like to read a few verses out of 2 Corinthians 5, and then we'll pray and we'll worship the Lord. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 1, Paul writes, For we know that if the tent that is our heaven, our, excuse me, our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly, do- heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found unclothed. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And what a good reminder that is, that we do wait. We're in these tents, these earthly bodies for a time, and we wait for that day when the Lord would choose to come to us And he's given us his spirit as a guarantee of that day. As surely as we were born and woke up this morning, we'll wake up in the kingdom of God. And so let's pray and let's just worship the Lord. Uh, Jesus, we are so grateful to you, uh, Lord, for your goodness of that promise. Lord, uh, we also read in Colossians that we have put on the new man. Lord, we we are already clothed in your righteousness. Lord, but we battle. Today we battle against the unrighteousness that's still in our bodies and our minds, Lord. Lord, we wait for the day when that's removed. And so we just ask that now you would fill us with your spirit as we meditate on your truth, on your word, that you would just give a a great foretaste of what it is that we wait for. We ask in the name of Jesus. battle we won't fear the night we will walk the valley with you by our side you will go before us you will lead the way we have found a refuge only you can say sing with joy now our god is for us the father's love is a strong and mighty fortress raise your voice now the love is great stand against us if our God is for us. Even when I stumble, even when I fall, even when I turn back, still your love is sure. You will not abandon, you will not forsake, you will cheer me on with your never-ending grace. Sing with joy now, our God is for The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now, the love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Neither height nor death, neither height nor death can separate us. Hell and death will not defeat. Son to free us holds me in his love. Neither high nor death will separate us. Hell and death will not defeat us. He who gave his son to free us holds me in his love. Sing with joy now. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your voice now. No love is greater. Who can stand against us if our God is for us? Sing with 
joy now our God is for us the Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress raise your voice now no love is greater who can stand against us if our God is for us Righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God, one with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior With Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God We are a moment, you are forever Lord of the ages, God before time, we are a vapor, you are eternal, love everlasting, reigning on high. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the
be unto your name. We are the broken, you are the healer, Jesus, Redeemer, mighty to save. You are the love song we'll sing forever, bowing before you, blessing your name. so thankful that you are the lamb who was slain, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Lord, who died, was buried in our place, having taken our sin on yourself, and you rose into new life, Lord, and you've given us that new life. We thank you that that new life won't start after we die, but we have it now. We thank you for the joy that you give us, Lord. The joy that doesn't even make sense sometimes. The peace that passes all understanding, Lord. Lord, it's such a privilege to call you our all in all. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. And Jesus, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I 
I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. And Jesus, you're the Lamb of God. Worthy is your name. Jesus, you're the
for us uh, more than we can ever even imagine. Lord, we thank you that you have given all. You've given your firstborn son, a son in whom you are well pleased for us. Lord, we do consider ourselves unworthy, unworthy of your sacrifice, unworthy of your grace, unworthy of your mercy, to be sealed by your spirit with the promise that we are eternally yours and that Though we groan in our tents today, Lord, we await a heavenly home not made by hands, but made by God. We thank you, Lord. No one else has cared for us like you. No one else will be faithful like you. And so now, Lord, we ask you that you would fill us with your spirit, Lord, that you would speak truth to us. Lord, so often we are um, content to believe our truth to live our truth. But Lord, there is no truth outside of you. And it's by your truth that we are set free. So open our eyes, Lord. Open our hearts. And I pray that you would just fill Brett with your spirit as he opens the word to us, Lord. That we, we would just willing, re, willingly receive as though from you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's take a moment, greet those around us, and then we'll get into the word. Take this family. 
reminds me of youth group. Man. Come on. I'm just kidding. You're fine. <clears throat> I would say, let's, do, let's go. And then they would like talk to each other. Be like, okay. <clears throat> One of my youth kids did come up to me and they were like, you're teaching tonight, aren't you? I was like, yeah. How'd you know? They're like, you're, you're jittery. You jump around. You only do that on your team. I'm like, got me. Uh, uh, Second Samuel, if you would. Or if you have a Hebrew Bible, 32nd Samuel. Samuel 32. The book of uh, Second Samuel is divided semi-arbitrarily. And uh, it was, I did like a whole, st- like, why was it split here? The answer is because somebody just decided to with the with the Vulgate or the, the Septuagint or one of those ones. They were trying really hard to like make it into kingdoms. And so they called it first kingdom, second kingdom. And then they got to the books of Chronicles and they just called it third and fourth kingdoms. And then everybody kind of realized pretty fast that it didn't really work. So just went back to called Samuel. And then, uh, but they kept the split. So it's always been the same exact book. It's the same one. But for some reason, we have a split, and now we're in 2 Samuel, and the Hebrew Bible doesn't split it. So there's some facts you didn't need. (laughs) Um, We're calling this an unusual transition. Again, the the narrative just continues from the last last book. Or I'm calling this also the Don't Die Challenge. (laughs) So I will introduce you to the contestants (laughs) in a little bit, but not yet. Let's pray. (laughs) Lord, thank you so much for this time. And I just ask by your spirit that you would speak. I I want to hear from you. Would you bless this, please? I pray for the filling of your spirit in uh, Jesus' name. Amen. It came to pass after the death of Saul, 2 Samuel 1, 1. When David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites and David had stayed two days in Ziklag, On the third day, behold, it happened that a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dust on his head. So it was when he came to David that he fell to the ground and he prostrated himself. And David said to him, from where have you come? And he said, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did the battle go? Please tell me. And he answered, the people have fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead and Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. This is the moment after 14 years where David's life finally changes from his whole running 
everything that's been leading up to this and God anointing him when he's 15. At this point, he's maybe 28 to 30, somewhere in there. And so for 14 years, 15 years, he's been on the run. And this guy comes before him and says, hey, Saul is dead and Jonathan is dead. So David said to the young man, how do you know? The young man who told him said, as I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear, and indeed the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me, and he called to me, and he, I answered, here I am. He said to me, who are you? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said to me again, please stand over me and kill me, for agony has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So... I stood over him and killed him because I was not sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm, which David would have recognized from his time with Saul, and have brought them here to my Lord. And this is when David knows it's true. Saul's dead and Jonathan is dead. A couple of small points before we get to the main one. Uh, this man's story is most likely a lie. Uh, because of a couple things. One is, you know, in the previous chapter that it says, he, it says nothing of his spear. It says that he killed himself with his sword. And then also he was already dead when his armor bearer saw him. And that entire story is totally incompatible with what's being said here. It would be interesting, though, if it was true, because this man's an Amalekite. And if you recall, the kingdom was to be ripped from Saul's hands because he failed to do what? kill all the Amalekites, as God had said. You will judge them. You will wipe them all out, every single one. And Saul instead saves the best as slaves and as uh, sacrifices. And you recall that entire, we might actually go there. <clears throat> but why would he lie about this? Well, because in a usual scenario, in a usual transition, this guy expected credit. And that's why we call this an unusual transition. Um, typically, across history, when new kings come into power, they attempt immediately to consolidate that power and make it strong, doing a couple things. First of all, it was very common to immediately kill all rivals to power, which includes the entire previous family's uh, the entire previous king's family, every single person. We'll see that come into play later with Mephibosheth because they think this is going to happen and they run out of the house immediately. Um, <clears throat> second, they would take the physical seat of power, the place that he reigned from, the physical signs of power, as in the literal crown, the wives, and then the, the person would move to crush those who dishonored or did not support them previously. Anybody who supported the old king or su supported another challenger to the throne would be killed and then moved to benefit those who honored or supported him. And then uh, to end all debts, right? So like I, you as the king now, you reward those who helped you get there. <clears throat> and if you can just put yourself in this position, how tempting this must have been for David, right? Like again, remember that this man is standing here and all these men that are around him, they just got done with this, all of their families being torn from them at Ziklag. And the reason that they were in Ziklag is because they were running from Saul. It was wrong. They shouldn't have gone there as we talked about, but you could, you could kick that can further and you could blame Saul and be like, if Saul hadn't been chasing me, I would never have been in the Philistines. My family would never have been taken. I wouldn't have gone through this entire thing. He's been chasing me for years. And the temptation is, I think like, exactly that. Okay, it's time to go. He's brought them here. He's dead. I'm, I'm, I need to do the thing. I need to take over. I need to kill everybody. I need to consolidate power. <clears throat> but, verse 11, David took hold of his own clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. Recall that Israel was a nation that was to represent God. And David was a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> David had learned a lesson, which was that God's will was to be done. 
and it was to be done God's way and in God's time. We've talked about this several times. And this goes all the way back to Abraham. And God said, you were going to have a kid. And then he tries to have the kid through Hagar, right? And then he's afraid that he's going to die. And so he lies about his wife, Sarah, several times. And God keeps like defending him and being like, stop it. And eventually Abraham gets to this point where he's like, okay, God is going to do his will, his way. I just need to trust and obey. And he's like, I'll kill my son if you want me to. I believe that you can resurrect him. And then the same thing is true with Jacob, where he, him and Rebecca try to work things out and make it happen in their own way. The older will serve the younger. I'm going to make this happen through this, this whole connivory. And finally, he comes to the end of himself at the river, and the Lord taps his, his leg so he can no longer run. And then he goes to face Esau, and it's all in the Lord's hands, right? Jacob can't do anything about it. He learns this lesson. <clears throat> and then you see Joseph being an example of a person who figured it out, where there's these prophecies— and I believe that God's going to do him, and I'm stuck in this hole. I'm just going to serve the Lord. And he serves the Potiphar, and then he serves in the jail, and the Lord takes him into the place that he's supposed to be. And so David, a man after God's own heart, recognizes this same thing. He, rather than celebrate the death of Saul, he instead, with the heart of the Lord, like understands what this death represents. <clears throat> Look at verse 12. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. Though this might have been good news for David personally, it wasn't good news for the nation as a whole. This represented the end of a life that had brought upon itself a lot of tragedy, both to Saul himself and also his own nation. <clears throat> one note I have is that uh, all of the men around David went through a lot of the same sufferings that he did for the same reason. And David's like, they could have, they would have been right behind him and in, in going and celebrating this death, but instead they follow their leader and they mourn as well. David said to the young men who were with him, what are, where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien Amalekite. And David said to him, how was it that you were not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? So David called one of the young men and said, go near and execute him. And he struck him so that he died. And David said to him, your blood is on your own head for your own mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. And we see a very unusual transition beginning of power in which David will not attempt in any way to put himself in any position unless the Lord directs him to do so. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll talk about this more in detail. Let's just keep going for now as you'll see this. David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Um, you'll notice through this that it will it, it repeatedly, like we're going to see the same thing happen several times because it's so unusual and it's also so important that David makes sure these things are recorded. He writes a song for them and then everybody knows this. He told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. And then they go on. Uh, quick note, the book of Jasher. We don't have that. The Bible mentions some books. They're not in there. Um, I, there's been a really fun conversation that has been had a few times of like, how did we get the Old Testament? If you're ever interested in that, there's this specific guy. Uh, we're going to do some apologetic stuff on Sunday sessions, I think in March. But in the meantime, there's this guy named Mike Winger on YouTube. And if like this whole concept, you're like the book of Jasher, why don't we have that? Mike Winger is amazing on YouTube. You should look him up. He has a whole thing on like how the Old Testament formed and how the New Testament, and it really didn't, like it, we, they knew right away kind of what was. <clears throat> Neither here nor there a little bit, but. And here's his song. I won't sing it. <laughs> the beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not on the streets of Ashkelon. This is the Philistine cities. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields or offerings, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there. The shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. He is honoring the Lord's anointed. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. 
O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul. And then they keep going. Let's keep going. <laughs> Go to 25. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan was slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war perished. So he writes this beautiful song, and again, important because he is intentionally honoring the Lord's anointed in Saul, and because David's priority is the Lord, is, is honoring God and also this nation, and he, he understands what this represents. A couple of things on this, and I want to I spend some time on Jonathan because he's, he's really awesome. First of all, um, I, this... And it must be said in the culture in which we live, the end of this where he says your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. You might have had this tossed into your face before as far as an example of homosexuality. That's not at all what's inferred. I, I, I feel like that's obvious, but uh, a couple things to help you with that if then anybody tries to toss this in your face. First of all, this is the same love that it, when it talks about your love your neighbor as yourself. That's the same word. And also, um, obviously, homosexuality was seen like is sin in the law. And so the Bible wouldn't have recorded this relationship that they had so positively were at that. This is this even ancient, more ancient thing called friendship, which is pretty cool. <laughs> and honestly, the fact that he says, your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Yes, it does say something about the incredible relationship, the friendship that they had. It also says something about <laughs> David's marriage relationships and how bad they were, frankly. <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit as we get there. But if I can, I really want to stop for a second and talk about Jonathan. This is a little bit of an aside. <clears throat> but in 1 Samuel, we see a couple times that David and Solomon, in their friendship, they also have this agreement, a covenant between them. The first part is the Lord shall between, be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. Saul and, or David and Jonathan promised to take care of each other's families. The other thing is that Saul or Jonathan says to David, there's a lot of names, so please forgive me if I get stuff mixed up, mixed up today. Jonathan says to David, you shall be king over Israel. Even Saul, my father, knows this. And um, I just feel like there's a, a really important point to be made here. The, the anointing of David that he was going to be king at some point becomes well known in Israel. We don't know right away. Like Samuel anoints David king. Is it immediately like we're back in like when David is 15, right before David and Goliath? Does everybody know right away or is this something that comes out later? Uh, we don't know exactly. But at this point, it is or in well before this, it was well known in Israel that God had anointed David in this way. And I love that Jonathan hears this and he looks at David and he says, okay, right? <clears throat> and if you contrast this also with uh, Saul is with the Amalekites and he refuses to kill them all and he keeps them for himself. Samuel comes to him and he says, I am taking, God says to you, I am taking away the kingdom from your hands. Remember this? And Saul looks at Samuel and he, like, Samuel begins to walk away, and Saul reaches out, and he grabs the hem of Samuel. I got to work really hard on getting all these right. Grabs the hem of Samuel's coat, and it rips off, and Samuel turns around and says, Saul, just as this has ripped out of your hands, this hem is ripped, so will God rip the kingdom from you. It has been taken from your family forever because of your disobedience. <clears throat> I feel like if you consider what was the right and godly thing for Saul to do at that point? It would be what Jonathan did, which was to simply say, okay, right? It's so like, follow me with this. <clears throat> for Saul, it was because of his sin that his reign was to end. The proper response from Saul was to say, okay, God, this was always your kingdom, and if you're taking it from me, I will give it back. Does this make sense? We see David do the right thing and saying, God, this is your kingdom. If you're going to give it to me, you can do it whenever. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. 
Jonathan does the same thing. He looks at David and he says, he's, Jonathan is a prince. He's in line technically to be king after Saul. But he says, all right, nope. I, if this is what God is doing, it's yours. <clears throat> it takes a certain bravery and courage and trust in the Lord to say yes when God tells us to do stuff, right? I've never tried this before. I've never done it. I'm going to step out and obey the Lord. But there's also, I think, a very important trust and courage in the Lord where when God tells us to stop, we stop, right? <clears throat> when God says this thing is over, we let it go. And sometimes that can be because of sin. Oh, you know, like I've blown something as we see here with Saul. But other times it can simply be that the season is over and God is doing something else. <clears throat> I'm trying to do what Levi was doing in the teachings, which is to always bring it back to how Jesus did it right. I love that. I don't know where you went. I was trying to point at you. <clears throat> and uh, I usually leave that as an exercise for the teacher, but I'm trying to work that in. You recall Jesus many times uh, is famous and he's walking around and the, 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 the people come to him and then he says to his disciples, no, it's time for me to move on, right? I'm not staying in this place any longer, I go. Or even in the garden when he's, Lord, if there's any other way, take it from me. No, this, like, this season is ending. It's time for you to go to the cross. You see Moses, uh, because of his sin, he's not allowed to go into Israel, but when his time comes, he hands it over to Joshua, right? And I feel like this is really important. And <clears throat> David understands something that Saul has forgotten, which is that, yes, Israel is not his, but also, um, th like, a king is not what Saul is, right? Saul is an Israelite, a servant of the Lord, right? And he happens to be king at this time, but at some point it ends. Um, I know dad hates it when people use him as an example, but <laughs> we had conversations. Sorry. <laughs> it's just, easy. it's what I know. Um, we did have, I remember many conversations like every year, like pretty much once a year or whatever, you know, I'd be like, he, it, is it time yet? You know, like, am I, am, is, am I done as a pastor? Like, and he said, I want to be done when the Lord tells me to be done. Right? Like, I love this and I love pastoring. It's my favorite thing. This is kind of my own phrasing now, but, but uh, whenever it's done, it should be done. And I just want to submit to that from the Lord. I remember that even with, in my own life, in the small way with youth pastoring, whenever that was, uh, when I felt like the Lord ended that, I wanted to be really quick to be like, okay, I'm done. <clears throat> and I just love the example of Jonathan in this, second in line to the king. And he says, all right, this is your thing. Why didn't Saul give it up? Why does it take the, the taking of Saul's life for him to get out of this position? We don't know exactly, but it could have been because he saw himself as king. He didn't know who he would be without that. He wasn't willing to let it go. <clears throat> You're a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. That's our identity. We're, we're Christ's. And everything else is just the season that God has. It could have been because it seems that he loved power or specifically like he loved the praise of men. He says to Samuel at that moment, please come back with me and honor me before the elders of the people. And I, it was because of Saul's sin that he, it was taken from him. But it's important for us, I think, that our reputation and our legacy also belong to the Lord, right? <clears throat> he gets to decide. <laughs> if you're unknown, that's fine. If the legacy is over, it's fine. We have nothing to prove or accomplish. It's like... We just, our, our goal is obedience. I'll finish with this. Remember Jeremiah, who taught and wrote an entire book, did all this prophecy for all the years, and had no one listen to him the entire time. The whole time, nobody ever listened to him. They just threw him in pits and stuff. Poor guy. <clears throat> but he's spoken of as a success, a man of faith in the eyes of God. Why? Because success is simply obedience, Right? And David understood that. Chapter two, it, it happened after this that David inquired of the Lord. Remember the entire message last time about Saul inquiring of a medium. David inquired of the Lord. After all this season of kind of him being in despair, he's back to like, Lord, whatever you want. 
He says, shall I go up to any cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. The obvious thing to do was to go to Gibeah, where Saul's throne was. David said, where shall I go up? And the Lord said to Hebron. Hebron is significant in David's life before this, but it's also where Abraham had built his altar and where the grave of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were. And so in a lot of ways, David going back to Hebron is the nation of Israel, the person who is like going to lead it, beginning by going back to where it should the Lord, right? As God guided the fathers, so God begins to guide David. And they go back to where Abraham built the altar to the Lord. It also was in the middle of uh, like an area that's already supported David in a lot of ways. And so it made strategic sense as well. So David went up and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite. I always like in scripture how you get a bunch of really weird names and then like a completely normal name out of nowhere. And David brought up the men who were with him, every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Then the men of Judah came to David, and they anointed David king over the house of Judah. Excuse me. And they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh-Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the the men of Jabesh-Gilead and said to them, You are blessed of the Lord, for you have shown this kindness to your Lord, to Saul, and have buried him. May the Lord show kindness and truth to you, and I also will repay you this kindness. So David is, again, in his influence, and whatever amount of influence he has, he is honoring the people who honored Saul. Um, You recall Saul, at the beginning of his reign, was like a scared little dude, farmer boy, and the first time where the spirit of the Lord comes upon him, and like he goes out and like, like in war as a king is when the men of Jabesh Gilead are surrounded and then their enemies are like, hey, we'll let you go, but we have to pluck out one of your eyes. Every single man in the whole city will pluck out one of your eyes. And they're like, yeah, give us a week to think about it. And then they send, they send messengers to Saul and the spirit of the Lord comes on Saul and he just rose up, goes over there and, and sets him free. And so these same men from where his kingship started are the ones who go and rescue his body from the temples of the Philistines and bury him. And so David, again, is honoring those who have honored the previous king. An unusual transition. Verse 8. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Machanahim. (laughs) I actually think I did that better than I thought I did. And made him king over Gilead, the Asherites, Jezreel, Ephraim, over Benjamin, and over all Israel. So you might not have known this before, but there is actually the split that happens later is happening here. We see a northern kingdom and we see a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom of Judah follows David and the northern king follows this guy, Ishbosheth. So this is where we're going to play this fun game. And as we go through these chapters, I'll summarize a little bit. This is called the don't die game. (laughs) And I made this because I just genuinely found it really hard to like keep track of what was happening. And so I just, we just made this. So here's, here's our people on the left side. We have the people who are with Saul. So we have Saul himself. And then we have his general whose name is Abner. There's two really unfortunate naming patterns. The first of which is that there are way too many people whose names start with a, It just makes it confusing. So here we go. (laughs) There's the king and there's the general. There's King Saul and his uh, his, uh, general, Abner. We see him actually back at David and Goliath. So he's been around Saul forever. And then Saul has a son called Ishbosheth. Abner has the army behind him. And so he has the ability to. And Abner rejects the army like the, the voice of God and attempts to basically set himself up as king. This is what Abner is doing. Rather than submit to David, he's making himself king, but he's not going to do it directly because that's not going to work. So he sets up Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, as like a puppet king. We see that he's a weak man, a kind of a coward man. He attempts to make one political move the entire time and it blows up in his face and then he dies. Oh, wait, I've ruined it. <laughs> Pretend he didn't hear that. And on the other side, we have David the king 
and we have his general, also nephew, Joab. Joab is kind of annoying <laughs> to David a lot. Joab is like a fierce, bloodthirsty dude. And he has absolutely no patience for David's patience a lot. And so he's going to get David in a lot of trouble. And David has a brother. He has two brothers, but we're just going to focus on the one named Asahel. Asahel. And there's another one named Abishai, but I didn't put him on there because it was too much. Asahel is Joab's kid. Are you with me so far? Okay, so don't die challenge. Obviously, we already know King Saul, he's dead, lost the challenge. Sorry, see ya. <clears throat> but now Abner and Ishbosheth are the king. Is this, are you with me so far? Okay, all right, so we're gonna go through a lot. Try and stay with me. I apologize for how, in some ways, this is just gonna be narrative driven, but here we are. Ishbosheth was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. Only the house of Judah followed David. The time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Um, excuse me. Now Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth went out from Machanaim to Gibeon. Here's where we arrive at our second kind of annoying naming problem, which is where if you look at a map of Israel, this is modern Israel, uh, roughly around where the top of the Dead Sea is, this is the split between the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. And so you can see that, and there's the capital cities, uh, Gibeah, or sorry, here, let me just show you my next one, which is that there are four different places that start with G-I. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so confusing to me that I made this just for myself to study. So Mount Gilboa in the north, you can forget about that one. That's the mountain that they just had the battle on that Saul got killed. With me? Okay. Gilead, over there on the right side, is where Ishbosheth rules from. It's different. And then Gibeah is where Saul ruled from. And then Gibeon is like right by it. And it's where we're about to see this fight. So what happens is obviously you've got these two nations next to each other. And so they're going to kind of test each other. And what happens is that from Gilead, Abner brings his armies down and David's armies go out. Army kind of goes out just to make sure, right? I don't know why you're coming around here. Maybe you're just going to Gibeah to pick up something you forgot from your sock drawer. <laughs> but regardless, David's army goes out just to make sure nothing, you know, they're not going to try to invade. And so they end up meeting up at verse 13. Joab, the son of Zeruah, and the servants of David went out and they met Abner by the pool of Gibeon. You with me so far? So here we go. We got these two people, Abner and Joab, and they've met. I'm going to kind of summarize a little bit, but they sat down one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of this pool. And you've got these two men of war and they're kind of bloodthirsty dudes, but they're not like sure if there's supposed to be a fight yet. Like, are we cool? Are we going to fight? Like, what's happening? And so they're sitting, and they're separated by this body of water, and they're just looking at each other. And Abner says to Joab, let the young men now arise and compete before us. Hey, let's have, a, let's have like a little fight. You want to have like a little fight? And Joab's like, sounds great. So they arose and went over by number, 12 from Benjamin, that's north, followers of Ishbosheth. I like how they repeat all this information because they know it's hard to follow a little bit. And 12 from the servants of David. And each one grasped his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side, and they all fell down together. Therefore, that place was called the Field of Sharp Swords, which is in Gibeon. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly, what happens when you stick a bunch of, like, bloodthirsty young dudes and you're like, hey, what if you guys fought that they'd fight? <laughs> So they end up, it turns from like, I don't know, an ostensibly friendly like test to this where all the, it turns into a full on battle. And so now like this is where the moment has crossed and they are officially like kind of at war with each other. There was a very fierce battle that day and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. Skip ahead very quickly and we'll come back to verse, uh, well, chapter three, verse one. It says there's a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. <clears throat> now go back 
to this battle in verse 17, chapter two. And this is the overall pattern. <clears throat> Whatever God's intention like was, like was Joab really listening to the Lord? I don't know if they really wanted to have a battle here. There's nothing about God necessarily in this. Like, let's just sacrifice a few kids. Yeah, okay. So, but God is going to work through all of this anyway. And you see that like God is bringing up David. But there's some important things that happen. In the midst of this battle, right after the pool and they fight and everybody's going like, all right, fine, we're fighting. And they start to fight. Joab, or uh, goodness, I got to look at this. Abner starts to lose. There were three sons of Zariah there, Joab and Abishai, he's the guy we left off, and Asahel, and Asahel was as feet of foot, fleet of foot, as a wild gazelle. Let's go, dude. He was like super fast. I asked AI to make these, and like they look okay. Like I don't, That guy looks kind of fast, I guess. It's like <laughs> he's in the... the the ranks with uh, John, like him and John could like fight, you know what I'm saying? Or could race because John's the other person in the book of John, right? Where he runs ahead of Peter and like, it's like, I beat him. I beat him there. And I love how John can't help but write that, but maybe we should have them race. <laughs> we'll see who is really the fleetest of foot. But he picks Abner to pursue. And in going, he did not turn from the right hand or to the left from following after Abner. This guy, Asahel, and his speed really wants to be the guy to kill Abner, General Abner, and get his, uh, like, get the, the, yeah, the praise, the credit from that. Maybe even his armor as a trophy, and so he's, he's running after him. But there's this thing that he doesn't realize, which is that you should always fear an old warrior. <clears throat> there's probably a reason why they're still old, even if they've been in a lot of fights. And so Abner says, to, looks behind him and says, are you Asahel? And he says, I am. Abner says to him, turn aside to your right hand or to your left and take a hold on one of the young men and take his armor for yourself. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. He warns him. He's like, dude, don't chase me. I'm going to kill you. Like, you think you can catch me, but I'm going to kill you. And I don't want to fight with your brother over the fact that I killed you. Verse 22, Abner said again, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How could I face your brother Joab? Civil war is a rough thing, isn't it? You kill the people that you know, you know their family. However, he refused to turn him aside. Therefore, Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of the spear, so that the spear came out his back, and he fell down there and died immediately. It was apparently such a scene that as many as came to the place where Asahel fell down and died, stopped dead. He failed the challenge. <laughs> <clears throat> pretty gory death, honestly. We see that Abner has a clear case of some like self-defense. Like this is a war. He doesn't mean, to, like, he doesn't want to kill him. He tries to ask him like, please stop chasing me. And he doesn't, he dies. This is going to come into play later. Uh, you could, you could take this by analogy and say, uh, you should fear <laughs> perhaps wisely the tools of the enemy that are old if that makes sense. The temptations that the enemy uses over and over, never think that you're better than them and that you can get close without, and think that you could win, stay far away, stay close to the Lord <laughs> instead. So they chase each other for a while and then finally Abner gets his group together and they stand as a unit and he calls out to Joab and says, Joab, like we're brothers. This is going to be bitter if we fight this whole time. Why don't we just stop here? And Joab says, okay, let's, if you hadn't said anything, we would have fought you all the way to the morning, but we will leave this. So Joab blows a trumpet, verse 28, and the people stood still and did not pursue Israel anymore. <clears throat> verse uh, 30, so Joab returned from pursuing Abner, and when he had gathered all the people, they were missing of David's servants, 19 men, and Asahel, so 20. But the servants of David had struck down 360 men. So this is a decisive victory for the forces of David. Obviously, this is what God is doing. And I can't help but think again that all of this could have been prevented by a person simply submitting to what the Lord wanted in the beginning, right? This goes back so many so far, you could you could kick this can really far, but like Abner knew, he says it later. He knew that David was the one who was anointed to be king. If he would have just submitted to that and not tried to become king through Ishbosheth, this whole thing would have been avoided. All these people that have died and, and Asahel and everything else, like all this could have simply been avoided if Abner had simply had humility. 
and submitted to what God wanted, right? And you could back that up, probably learned it from Saul, <laughs> and so on and so on. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1, there was a long war between the house of Saul and David, but David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. And aside very quickly about the sons of David. Sons were born to David in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon. He's going to be in here later. The second, uh, Chiliab by Abigail, the widow of Nabal. And then we see that David had taken new wives. Absalom, the son of Machah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. This is modern Golan Heights. So this is potentially a political match in which David as king is beginning to make these, uh, these political marriages or have children politi for political reasons, and he's, he's making with an ally. And the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Hagith, and the fifth, Shep Thathiah. <laughs> Got me, man. The son of Abital. The sixth, Ithream, by David's wife, Igla. That is six wives. Would you turn with me quickly to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17? Deuter oh, nope. It's supposed to say Deuteronomy 17. I ruined it. Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. Some of this is set up. If you have a pen, I'm going to give you a few things to underline. And uh, some of them will come into play today. And some of them will come into play later. Deuteronomy 17, starting in verse 14. When you come to the land in which the Lord your God has given you, and you possess it and dwell in it, you will say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Isn't this interesting? If you've never seen this, God knew that Israel was going to demand a king. And he goes ahead and sets, sets laws for it. You shall surely set a king over you whom God chooses. It shall be one of your brethren. You may not set a foreigner over you. And then look at verse 16. He shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people of Egypt to return, or nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. If you have a pen, might I encourage you to underline, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Underline that. You're going to see it again in a few months on a different king when somebody else is teaching and they bring you back here and you're all going to be like, oh yeah. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. And then look at verse 17. Underline the first seven words here. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Let's do a couple others real quick while we're here. Verse 18. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this entire law in a book. <clears throat> Underline that, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. That's going to come into play next week. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life that he will learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. You can turn back to 2 Samuel. Chapter 3. The ones that are relevant here is that we see that David is beginning to multiply wives for himself. Um, the Bible many times records a thing and does not approve of the thing. This is polygamy on the part of David, and uh, the, that's one of the things that the Bible uh, records and does not approve of. There's a lot of conversations that you could have around this, um, but we see that it, be, it is... For David, it's not as obviously an issue... It, I mean, who's to say what else could have happened with the obvious <laughs> exception of Bathsheba and Uriah, right? And that entire thing as we'll get into. But we see that David's pattern is going to be emulated by his son Solomon to ruinous degree. <clears throat> Verse six. I'm gonna kind of explain this for the sake of time. It was while there, there was a war between the house of Saul and David, Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. So again, like I said, the uh, idea here is 
the idea here is that Abner is really actually the king through Ishbosheth, and Abner is is strengthening his power and and perhaps making a move to uh, like actually install himself as king in some way. We don't we don't know, but he, he's just getting more power. And Ishbosheth is for the first time in his entire reign going to try and do something about this, and so he makes a false accusation. Ishbosheth said to Abner, "Why have you gone into my father's concubine?" Recall earlier that we had said that a, con- or a new king would often take the uh, articles of power. One of the things was the wife. And so for Abner to sleep with one of Saul's wives or concubines would have been an obvious and intentional statement towards kingship. This is a false accusation, it seems, from this, but it seems like Ishbosheth is beginning afraid of Abner. And so he's trying to make a political maneuver to like get Abner out so that Ishbosheth can reign. This- without his interference. Does this make sense? Problem is he's super clumsy at this and is uh, not a psychopath and so therefore bad at ruling. <clears throat> Never mind on that. Abner became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth and said, am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, his brothers and his friends, and I have not delivered you into the hand of David, and yet you charge me today with this fault concerning this woman. May God do so to Abner, and more also, if I do not do for David as the Lord has sworn to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba, from the very north to the very bottom. Abner does not take this, and he's so angry about it, he just says, you know what? Fine, I'll switch teams. <laughs> so Abner leaves Ishbosheth, goes over and joins David's side and says, I will, like, you're going to accuse me of this. I'm leaving. I've been faithful to you, Ishbosheth. I have served the house of Saul. For you to accuse me of this and try to kick me out like this, I'm just going to go do the thing that I should have done from the beginning. <clears throat> And he could not answer Abner another word because he was afraid of him. So Ishbosheth is a weak man. Um, and Abner sent messengers on his behalf to David, saying, Whose is the land? Make your covenant with me, and indeed my hand will be with you to bring all Israel to you. And David says, Okay. So what Abner's going to do now is use his influence as governor, and he's going to go to the different tribes and meet with them and be like, Hey, you should really think about anointing David as your king. He's going to kind of take that, like, almost like a like a door knocking position. You know what I'm saying? Like in politics where people door knock and be like, hey, you should vote for this guy. That's what Abner's going to do with all of his influence. If he gets the chance, <clears throat> I will make a covenant with you. But one thing I require of you first, Hey, you can prove your actual loyalty to me, Abner, by doing this. And I actually really hate this. You shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael Saul's daughter. When you come to see my face. Recall that David had originally been betrothed to one of Saul's daughters because Saul was trying to get David out. And so he promised David a girl and then just married her off to somebody else. And then he had another daughter who was kind of like a firebrand. And he's like, she'll cause David all kinds of trouble. This will be great. So I will give her to him, but I'm going to make him have to bring me. He has to kill 100 Philistines. And so David's like, cool, and kills 200 Philistines. And then he gets married to Michael. And then when David has to run for his life later, Saul takes Michael and marries her to somebody else. So David says to Abner, I want you to, if you're going to come to my team, I need you to bring with me my old wife, Michael. Which like, I can understand this a little bit, but let's just continue. Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, from Paltiel, the son of Laish. She is remarried to a different guy. And verse 16, her husband went along with her, weeping behind her. And Abner said to him, get out of here. And so he left. I really hate this. I, it's really a complicated situation. You know, all this other kind of stuff. But like David has six wives. He doesn't need this. He doesn't need like to, he doesn't need articles of power. It seems vindictive on the part of David. And it just, it just feel to me, it feels wrong. I don't like it, but he does it. Abner had communicated with the elders of, the Israel, of Israel saying this. In the time past, you were seeking for David to be king over you. We're getting into the home stretch here. <clears throat> for David, uh, now then do it, for God has spoken of David, saying, by the hand of my servant David, I will save Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from all their enemies. So this Abner spoke in the hearing of Benjamin. So he's going out and he's stumping for David, saying, you guys really should 
uh, anoint David as your king as well. <clears throat> but, verse 22. At that moment, well, verse 21, Abner says to David, I've been running around for you. I'm going to go out and hit some more places that they make a covenant with you that you may reign over all of Israel. So David sent Abner away and he went in peace. Again, David is not being vindictive towards the people who served under Saul. But verse 22, at that moment, the servants of, servants of David and Joab, remember, who is the brother of the guy who got killed, came back from a raid, bringing much spoil with them. But David, Abner was not with David, for he had sent him away, and he had gone in peace. But when Joab came back and heard this, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and has sent, he has sent him away. And Joab hates Abner for obvious reasons, but also, like, you're going to have two generals? Abner's probably better at this. We don't know. <clears throat> So Joab goes into David and says, what have you done? Abner came to you. Why did you send him away? Surely you realize that Abner has come here to deceive you, to understand your weak points, your gates, your ins and outs, and to understand what you are doing so that he can attack. And when Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner who brought him back from the well of Sarah, but David did not know it. Now, when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Asael, his brother. Kills him roughly the same way. He got hit in the stomach with the spear, and so Joab stabs him in the same place and says, here, take the same thing you gave to my brother. A couple of points. First of all, um, Joab is obviously acting outside of the desires of David here. He's just acting out of his own desire for revenge, <clears throat> which is understandable, but also wrong, right? Also, Hebron was a city of refuge, which meant that under the Levitical law, that he, uh, Abner was safe there in the case of a killing from until like a trial could be had, which is why Joab specifically invites him where? Outside the gate to the well. So he kills him outside, right? So he loses the don't die challenge. Rip Abner. Afterward, when David heard that he heard it, he said, my kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever in the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and all of his father's house. Let there never fail to be in the house of Joab, one who has a discharge or is a leper, who leans on the staff or falls by the sword and who or who lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner because he had killed their brother Asael at Gibeon in the battle. So David curses Joab for this and his entire family and says, you've, you've acted in a way that is like, again, this entire unity that we have as a nation is tenuous. You're endangering like this, this new unity that we have. I was honoring the servants of Saul and you're acting out of revenge. It was a battle like, and David, he curses him for all this. And David makes sure that because think about this, like all the different tribes of Israel could now think, oh man, David is just going to get you close and kill you. And so this is a really dangerous moment for the entire thing. So David said to Joab and everyone with him, tear your clothes, gird yourselves with sackcloth and mourn for Abner, makes him cry over it. And they have this whole big funeral for Abner and everybody understands that David did not intend to kill Abner. Chapter four, and we'll be done. When Saul's son heard that Abner had died, he lost heart and all Israel was troubled. Saul's son, this would be Ishbosheth, had two men who were captains of troops. One was Banana <laughs> and the other Re Rechab, the sons of Rimen. Sonneth, uh, and then verse four is kind of interesting, but we're going to skip it because it'll, it'll come into play later. Verse five, the sons of Rimen, Re Rechab and Banana, set out and came at the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, lying on his bed at noon. And they came into the house, all into the inner part, as though to get wheat, and they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Re Rechab and Banana, his brother, escaped. And when they came to the house, they, he was lying on his bed, and they struck him and killed him, beheaded him, and took his head 
Did you know that David, after he uh, took Goliath and he like chopped his head off, he like, kept it with him for a while? Isn't that like crazy? Sorry, total aside. They beheaded him and took his head and ran the entire night escaping through the plain. So Ishbosheth dies, and we officially crown as our winners of the Don't Die Challenge. <laughs> David and Joab are the only people who live through this entire series of chapters. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron and said to the king, again, they're, we're trying to prove, you know, exactly what they're doing. And I'm sure every single person in David's entire army sees this. The guys in the court and they're like, you guys do not want to do this. And they're all like, okay. Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, this day of Saul and his descendants. But David answered Rechab and Banana and said to them, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all adversity. Look at this. As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all adversity. David's hope is in the Lord. David understands that the kingship is from the Lord. And that's the reason why it's wrong for these people to do this. <clears throat> when somebody told me saying, look, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good news, I arrested him and had him executed. The one who thought I would give him a reward for this news. How much more when you wicked men have killed a righteous person in his own house on his bed. I find it so interesting. David calls Ishbosheth a, a righteous man, right? He's like, you, this guy didn't deserve to be killed for this. I didn't want him to be killed for this. The Lord would have taken this. He was probably just trying to do the best thing he possibly could in this situation. And therefore shall I not require his blood at your hand and remove you from the earth. This is probably another entire discussion, but I, I do find it interesting. Uh, <clears throat> do we suffer because we don't pray for judgment more sometimes? I don't know. Remove you from the earth. Probably not something I should just say and then leave, but I'm going to say it and then leave it. So David commanded his young men and they executed them, cut off their hands and feet and hanged them publicly by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the tomb of Abner in Hebron. So we have a very unusual transition in which David recognizes that ultimately everything is about the Lord, that the kingdom belongs to God. It doesn't belong to David. David doesn't need it, but he'll obey the Lord in the midst of it. And so he rebuts every attempt to sin against God, even in the midst of his transition, in the midst of what he wants. And I think it's a, sim a simple example for all of us at the same time. <clears throat> May we be people who submit to the will of God and we seek nothing for ourselves, lest the Lord give it to us. And also that we have no need for anything that the Lord does not give. And we don't attempt to take from anybody else things that the Lord has not given. If the Lord has called and commanded, then he can do it. And may we say yes to the Lord and step out. And may we say no when the Lord says no, if that makes sense. No with the Lord. <clears throat> and uh, walk simply in obedience to the Lord, that that would be our goal. And David walks honorably in the midst of all of this. And he's about to be crowned for it. But that is next week. Amen. Fair enough. <clears throat> Way to go to David and Joab winning the Don't Die Challenge. <clears throat> I'm really bad at finishing messages in a way that like feels like it really cries out for another song. Do you want to do another song? <laughs> okay, let's pray. I'll give him a transition. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for the example of David who had every single reason to celebrate the death of Saul and yet recognized um, the tragedy that it represented in the heart of Saul and also for the nation and who simply sought to lift you high and to praise you. May we be in the same in our lives uh, committed to an eternal perspective and to a submitted perspective, no matter what that costs us. Have your way in Jesus name. Amen. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise. 
that rise from earth to touch your heart and glorify your name your name is a strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nations sing it louder cause nothing has the power to say your name Jesus in your name we pray come and fill our hearts today Lord give us strength to live for you to see in David uh, just this example, Lord, of a man who, uh, when was given authority by you, didn't use it for himself, Lord, didn't use it to get back at his enemies. Lord, in many ways, though it's not perfect, we use it to serve others. Lord, would you teach us to forgive our enemies? Would you teach us to honor those, to love those, who persecute us, speak evil of us, to not answer evil for evil. But Lord, we do recognize that in all of this, we need to see your name as our strong and mighty tower, as our shelter like no other, that the nations would sing it louder, Lord. And so we just thank you for the goodness and the sweetness of your word. We pray that you bless our evening, Lord, bless the rest of our week, and may we come together again on Sunday to sing your praises, and to open your word. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a good evening.